Hello, fine people, and a very warm welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. My guest today is famed virtuoso pianist and composer Cyprian Katsaris, one of the most renowned concert pianists of both the 20th and the 21st centuries. Katsaris has performed with the world's greatest orchestras and recorded extensively over his storied career. Welcome, Maestro Cyprian, and welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. Glad to have you. Thank you very, very much. I'm very happy to talk with you, Nikhil, and I send all my best uh, wishes and greetings to your listeners. Wonderful, wonderful. You are one of the great concert pianists of the modern age, a great artist and a master interpreter. And so from, from the beginning, let me ask you this question, Maestro. When, did you always improvise in your life, even from a young child, uh, when you were young? Yes, yes. Oh, yes, since I was very young. Your question is very interesting because many people ask me, again recently, uh, after performing, uh, they ask me, uh, how do you do it to improvise? And I just answer, it's a matter of training. That's all. It's a matter of training. And believe it or not, there was a, a student here uh, about two, three weeks ago because we are starting, we just started the a new cycle of master classes on internet. Right. And this lady uh, took a, a lesson for three hours, and she was asking me, she's a very nice uh, pianist, Madame Eliane Lust. She lives in uh, San Francisco, but she's also in Paris. And she was asking me, how do you do this? I cannot do it. I say, yes, you can. Yes, you can. No, 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 I cannot do it. <laughs> yes, you can. So I insisted, and I told her, just composed right now small theme, improvised a theme, anything. And she improvised something which had about, uh, I would say, seven or eight notes, maybe ten notes. <clears throat> and then I say, you see, you can do it now. I want you to imagine some harmonies with this. And she did it, you know, and I helped her and she did it and she was so happy. Why? Because she found out that she was able to be creative. You see what I mean? So you're and saying not it's just... not something that is only available to a few people, that anyone can actually access this? I personally believe that every human being has a huge creativity potential, but for whatever reasons in the past, for whatever incidents happened in the past, they the people forget about their abilities. And it is very important for each of us to try to restore those abilities. Now, you're going to ask me how you do that. Well, it depends also on the background, the education background of people, their beliefs, spiritually, philosophically, religious wise. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know if you're aware of that, but I am a Scientologist, like my big friend, like my big friend, Chick Corea. And uh, I haven't seen him now for a few years, but we met many, many times in Florida. We met in Los Angeles. We even improvised privately together, although we are very, very different. And I can give you an information <coughs> which, yes, please. Uh, which, might, which might not be public. I remember Chick telling me when he composed about uh, 40 years ago, I think it was about 40 years ago that he composed his children pieces, which were published. And he told me something very interesting. It's harder to they, it's harder to play his written music than it is to improvise. Exactly. So you know about that, right? You know about that. And I totally agree with him. And that's one reason why I like to start all my concerts uh, by improvising, because it... Uh, helps me to get into the mood of the concert, you know. So everybody has the ability to do so many things which w people are not aware of, wh whatever it is, you know, improvising or whatever else. So I would like, through this message, to tell to your listeners, please don't put yourself down and keep trying. And at some point something will happen and you can develop it little by little. 
That's wonderful. That's really encouraging, and it's, it's really great to hear you say that. Can I ask you a quick question? You are a graduate of the Paris Conservatory, and that has a very grand tradition stretching back into the 19th century, uh, even early to the end of the 18th century. Did that influence your... Because um, I've noticed the, the Paris Conservatory, it gave us Debussy, Ravel, and just a whole host of incredible composers. Does that... Is there something about the Paris Conservatory that sets you apart, the training? Uh, the training depends, of course, on the professors. I have a huge respect for the Paris Conservatory, which is, as you know, very prestigious. For your information, in case you were not aware about that, the two last first prizes in the two most prestigious classical piano international competitions, the Chopin competition in Warsaw, in 75, and uh, more recently, last year, the Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow were won by two young pianists who came from the Paris Conservatory. Now, the training depends, of course, on the, on the professors. I was lucky enough to have uh, two professors, uh, the first one, who were, by the way, uh, both of them, great uh, soloists, great pianists, not just teaching uh, pianists. You know what I mean? Right. The first one, Madame uh, Aline van Barensen, she was Dutch origin. She, she had a big career uh, in the first half of the 20th century. She played all Beethoven sonatas and Villa Lobos and Liszt and Chopin and BBC anything. And then when she went uh, for retirement, uh, the, the next professor I got was one of the greatest pianists of the 20th century, Monique de la Bruxellerie. Now right. let me tell you about her. Monique de la Bruxellerie was the first female classical pianist who played... Oh, this is unbelievable. I, I think I remember this from one of your interviews. Didn't she play yeah. the Rachmaninoff Third Concerto before so, before so many people in a very early time? <laughs> yes. It was, it was in 1945, and she was the first Western, Western female pianist, because maybe there were some uh, Soviet pianists who used to play, and we're talking about a lady, you know? Right. Then came... Uh, the, the 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 male uh, Western female pianist and I we, we 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 studied that very much together also Brahms number two concerto which is very difficult and the very first time I met her in the conservatoire when she took over uh, she said okay what do you want to play it was in the class I played Tchaikovsky number one concerto and then she said okay next week I want you to bring the Bach chromatic fantasy and fuga the Beethoven a second class sonata, the Opus uh, 110, uh, number 31, right. and Rachmaninoff Paganini Rhapsody for Piano and Orchestra. <laughs> All that in one week, in <laughs> one week. And it was a hard training. I was supposed to, uh, we were supposed, all the students, to, to practice every day 30 minutes nonstop scales, 20 minutes nonstop uh, octaves. So it was a very hard uh, uh, training. Uh, and but uh, this is about the worker side, yep. right? The worker, because the, the pianist, the, the worker has to first uh, accomplish his task, okay. and then, and then the artist can express himself or herself. So she used to say, when you go on stage, forget the mistakes, forget the memory lapse, and whatever, right. and just play hard as if it was the first time. Both of your teachers, one was uh, like a grand student, grandchild kind of, of Charles Valentin Alcan. And uh, the lady you just mentioned, she was the student of Emil von uh, Sauer, who was the pupil of Franz mm -hmm. Liszt. So do you feel like you are, in a way, a great grandchild of those two composers? Not at all. Not at all. And I'm sorry to disappoint you from my answer. And I will tell you why I say not at all. The reason is very simple. The reason is that, personally, I do not believe in verbal uh, transmission, I would say, of communications. So you just take uh, the, the famous uh, drill of the, uh, of the soldiers. I think they do that in the U.S. Right. You take 20 soldiers, 20 soldiers, you give a message to the first one, and he's supposed to relate 
to the next one and the next one and the a next one. A telephone game, and yes. At the end, <laughs> yes, and, and at the end, you have something else. Yeah. Okay, so now, if, if Liszt gave an information to his pupil, who gave it to another pupil, and, who, and again, and so on, uh, if it is an objective information, like Liszt or Chopin wrote on the score, I suggest that here you play fortissimo instead of piano, and it's written with his, by, with his own hand, then it makes sense. But when it is verbal, I, I do have some doubts. And I tell you why. I'm sorry to, dis- to no, uh, no. disappoint your listeners, but there, is a famous, uh, there was a famous pianist who died several years ago, uh, uh, who was probably a great pianist when he was younger and all that. Uh, I, I don't want to say the name, but some of the people will recognize him. He, and all, the, all his PR was based on the fact that he was a student of a student of Liszt. Ah. And for me, for me, for me, this is not a great Liszt player. Okay? Forget the marketing of the, of the major companies, uh, uh, recording companies, forget all that. He is not at all comparable to the greatest Liszt player and the only one who was Georgi Cifra. Ah, wonderful. I'm glad. That's a great segue. Let's talk about him. You, did, is it true that you studied actually with him for a short time? No, not at all. Not at all. This is just a, a legend. Not at all. A legend. But maybe, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this is, when I say a legend, I mean, in French, when we say it's a legend, it could also mean uh, something invented all right. uh, it, by, by the imagination of some people. Okay. No, no, no. But I don't know if you are aware, Nikhil, are you aware that he was a great jazz improviser? Yes, I have seen on you, or listened on YouTube, and it almost sounds like he's like Art Tatum in a way. Yes, of course. Well, Tifra had a much, much, much greater uh, technical abilities than, uh, when I say technical, it's not the right word. I should say mechanical abilities. Okay. Because the technique for me, the technique is not just to be able to play the notes or to play them in a, in a, a fast uh, speed. Technique is also the art of phrasing, the art of having uh, several levels. The musicality. Uh, levels. Exactly, and on, on all these things. So let's, put, let's call it mechanically. No other pianist had the mechanic, mechanical abilities of Cifra. If you compare... I mean, I love Horowitz. I have nothing against Horowitz. He's one of my three or four most favorite pianists ever. Okay, there is no discussion. But I can tell you as a pianist who is totally independent uh, that uh, the the great transcriptions of Horowitz uh, are not as difficult to play as the ones of Cifra. And I noticed personally, and I'm sorry to shock uh, uh, anyone, but I noticed that when in a piece by list, like the second Hungarian Rhapsody, for example, or the 15th Hungarian, I mean, in a piece of list which has been changed uh, by Horowitz, when, when he uses his own things and it becomes list, uh, list Horowitz, of course it sounds great, but I noticed, I noticed that every difficult passage written by Liszt, Horowitz makes it easier with his own changes. Even if his changes are, are efficient and, uh, and um, impressive, when he finds a difficult part, you know, he, he changes it and uh, he makes something uh, easier for him. Okay? But it is made in such a great way that it also sounds great. You know, it sounds great, but it's like he's trying to escape some difficult things uh, written by Liszt. You know, <laughs> you can you can you can compare you can compare, for example, the Mendelssohn uh, transcription by Liszt of the wedding uh, march. Yeah. There are some incredibly difficult sections, really difficult, and Horowitz just changed them and makes something else 
which is very efficient, but uh, once again, you see, right. easier. But this is something Sifra would not do. He would not do such things. When Sifra changed something, it, 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 it goes even, even beyond belief. And I have always been shocked. I have always been shocked by the fact that the American audiences did not really know about Sifra, and they only found out about him recently through through and thanks to YouTube. Right. You know, I was I was shocked that the last time I played in New York at the Manes College of Music, uh, I was rehearsing on the piano just a few minutes before the the audience came in, and there was. Uh, two or three people uh, uh, getting seated, and there was a lady, and I told her, uh, I, I say, are you a pianist? She says, yes, I play the piano, I love I love piano, and I'm coming to attend these concerts, and blah, blah, blah. I say, have you heard of the name of Tsifra? She didn't know about his name. And right. several years ago, when Gramophone, the prestigious Gramophone magazine, requested from several uh, pianists to vote, uh, the greatest pianist of the 20th century or something like that. I was so shocked that even, uh, I mean, the name of Tsifra was even not, even not mentioned. Wow. Right. Even not mentioned. So thanks to YouTube, now people discover him well, again. Uh, Maestro, well, if you did study well, with him, did you actually meet him? At any, did you have any opportunity to meet him? Of course, several times. Uh, please don't call me Maestro. Call me Cyprian. Okay. 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 <laughs> call me Cyprian. Please, please. No, Maestro. So I met him several times. Uh, in fact, when when we moved to Paris from uh, from Cameroon in '59, I was eight years old. My family was uh, Greek from Cyprus, emigrates in uh, Cameroon during the French Cameroon colony. So when we came here in Paris, uh, when I was 11 or 12 years old, I think my mother took me to a concert. Uh, we were going every weekend to the concerts here of the of the orchestras with famous soloists and all that. And I will shall never forget this concert played by Chifra, which was a real shock. He <laughs> played the Hungarian the Hungarian fantasy of Liszt and the uh, first concert of Liszt with the orchestra, and it was just unbelievable. And I was wondering, shall I be able? Uh, one time in the future, one day in the future, to be able to play this Hungarian fantasy, which I adore. And I would never expect that 20 years later only, I recorded it with Eugene Ormandy and the Philadelphia Orchestra. You know that Ormandy was one of the five or six most legendary conductors uh, of the 20th century. Rachmaninoff recorded with him and all that. So, And then I had, a, it was a big honor to meet uh, Maestro Cifra, now he's a real maestro, to meet him uh, in 1974, I think, when I won the first prize at his uh, international competition, which used to take place in Versailles. And uh, I met him and I found out about the most humble, the most modest man I have ever met in my life. Maybe you know that he was from a gypsy family. Uh, because in Hungary, about 10% of the population is uh, is gypsy. Right. And I, res I respect a lot, a lot of these people who are incredibly talented. And at CIFRAP, we met several times. We met uh, several times. And I tell you something, which I think I never said in an interview. When I won his competition, I was entitled... I was entitled... Uh, uh, to make a, a recording for EMI, okay. uh, his, his master voice, EMI. And Sifra uh, was uh, insisting that I record the uh, Alcan, uh, Alcan record. Okay. But I was not interested. I was not interested. I am not a big fan of Alcan, uh, uh, except uh, four or five pieces, uh, like Le Festin des Orps or some studies. Right. Uh, and I was not at all interested, and I was—I didn't dare to ask him why did why didn't you record Alka? You know, <laughs> right? So I insisted to do some Schubert, and it was a totally different repertoire than Virtuoso repertoire. And uh, I recorded the three clavier stuk and several dances and and things like that. You know. 
So I met him, yes. Uh, maybe you know the story about the flight of the Bumblebee transcription. Ah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think so, yes. You recorded his transcription of the flight of the Bumblebee. Yes, but, you know, there are two recordings. In fact, there are three of them. One of them is during a television show which was uh, uh, devoted to Maestro Tsifra. That was on 24 April 1975. And I told him a few months before, can I get a score of your transcription of the Bumblebee? And he answered, I never wrote it down. <laughs> it's just like an improvisation. Right. You know? So then I insisted, and then what he did, he asked his son, who was a good friend also, who died very young at uh, the age of 39. He was a very good conductor. He asked him if he could write it down uh, using a, 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 a machine which could, uh, you, you can use it, you can listen much slower. And I think the son spent several months <laughs> to do such an incredible work. And then Cifra, um, he, uh, he checked it, he corrected it. And then he told me, okay, you want to play that? Look, he said, in a few months, on 25, uh, or 24 of April, 1975, uh, there was a big uh, TV program on the French TV uh, uh, national station at uh, prime time, 8.30. It was during three hours, from 8.30 p.m. until 11.30 p.m. This, is, this was a great program, once a month, which was devoted to either a great classical musician, like you know, Rubinstein did that, sharing right. Menuhin, Karajan with his Berlin Philharmonic, Sifra two times, Alexis Weissenberg, and so on. Or it, w- or it would be on uh, uh, with a French, uh, uh, not pop singer, but more the, the, the good uh, traditional uh, French uh, voices, you know, like Brassens, I don't know if you know okay. those names, Georges Brassens, etc. Okay. And each uh, honor entity, uh, a guest, honor guest, Cifra was the honor guest that month, had the right to invite who he wanted, other artists. So he invited me because I just had won his competition if, uh, last year in 74. And he said, okay, you want to play the Bumblebee? Here is the score. <laughs> and you will play it on 24. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I, I, started, I started practicing this incredible thing. <clears throat> and uh, one day I tried to play it in front of him, but it was not yet ready at the right tempo. Yeah. But on that evening of the TV show, I played it. And it was in his program. And you can see that on YouTube. If, if you type Katsaris Cifra, you will see my performance and Cifra is listening with the audience of the TV program right there. Yeah. And it was this was a live TV show. Okay? That, that was one version. Just type on YouTube Katsaris Cifra and you will or Cifra Katsaris and you will see it. And there is another version which is uh, live. The same year, I had a recital at uh, the beautiful home of uh, Georges Sand. Right. You know Georges Sand, who was the friend, the, the lady friend of Chopin, the yes, famous yes. writer. You know, one of the first feminists. And it, uh, they have a festival every year, and I played it as a fourth encore. You know, I didn't dare. To play it, I say, my God, maybe I, I, I'll mess up in front of all these people. <laughs> it was in June. It was in June, by the way. Yep. This was after the TV show. And uh, a friend was there pushing, play, play, you know, in the, in the backstage. So I, I did it, and it was recorded. The whole concert was recorded. And this version is also on YouTube, and it was published uh, on one or two uh, different CDs. That's wonderful. <laughs> Well, can I ask you something, Cyprian? Um, obviously, he, if he selected you to play for him, he obviously thought highly of you. But d- w- can you relate? Did he ever talk to you about what he felt about your playing? Have you heard from him that he liked your playing? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I don't dare to repeat what he said about me, which is in the, in the promotional uh, kits of uh, my agents. Uh, I, I cannot say that myself. You can, you can, uh, you can find it easily. I think he said an, an incredible sentence. But at some point, 
at some point, he was considering to re-record the second piano concerto of Bella Bartok, which he had played right before he escaped from uh, uh, Hungary. Yep. So when he came to Paris in '56 during the the Soviet occupation of Hungary, you know, there was a revolution against communism. Yep. And he played Bartok number two, and it was recorded by the radio. I think it was in Vienna or somewhere, and I think it's also something you can find on on YouTube. And at some point, he wanted to re he was considering to re record it with Orchestre de Paris, the Paris Orchestra, conducted by his son. And he told me, I would like you to record with me uh, for that uh, LP, you know, it was the LP times then, the Sonata of Bartok for two pianos and percussions, you know? Yep. So, bom, 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 bom. It's a great piece. <laughs> it, there is also a version for a piano and orchestra, for two pianos and orchestra. But for some reason, which I am not aware of, he did not uh, he did not uh, record the Bartok uh, concerto, and then we couldn't do this project. But he had that in mind. Okay. Uh, now uh, let, let me let me ask you about uh, transcriptions now. Uh, that was something that Horowitz was well known for. Now, Jifra, what motivated you to record, to create transcriptions and to do your own transcriptions? Was that something that was unique uh, in the 20th century among concert pianists to do your own transcriptions? Yes, yes, yes. So <clears throat> let me tell you, uh, I didn't do so many, so many yet. Um, it's also a matter of time. But uh, two of, or three of them, I think, now have been published by Schott, the famous German uh, publisher, Schott. And one of them, at least, no, two of them, two of them are, uh, to, uh, it's possible to listen to them on YouTube. Uh, one of them is the Badinerie of Bach. So the first time, uh, let me explain you, <coughs> Bach, uh, wants uh, the musicians to play this with two repeats. It's, it has two sections, and each section has to be played twice. So the first time of each section, I played uh, respecting 100% <coughs> excuse me, the notes uh, as written by Bach, and at each repeat, I do something... Uh, uh, something uh, completely, I don't know if the word mad is enough, but you can hear it on YouTube, Badinerie. And I also did the Toccata and Fugue, uh, the famous one for organ, which is also on YouTube. There is, I think, someone put it uh, for my concert in Shanghai uh, 13 years ago. Uh, you can find it also there. And uh, I also uh, I also transcribed maybe five or six more Bach stuff. Uh, there is a, there is also the most famous tango, La Compasita. Cyprian, can I ask you a question? Did you ever face any um, pushback to doing a transcription? Did anybody say, no, you cannot change any notes? That's disrespectful. Okay, uh, I will I will answer to this also. First of all. Let me answer to your first question. Why did I do that? You know, you always want what you don't have. When I was a kid, we were going with my mother to all those orchestral concerts. So I heard a lot, a lot, a lot of orchestral music. And I, it was so beautiful. You know, Haydn symphonies, uh, Beethoven symphonies, uh, La Moldau Smetana, whatever. And then I was wondering, why can I, why I cannot play this? things with my 10 fingers. Why should I need to be a conductor and depend on all those musicians, you know, as good as they are? So then I found out that there were all those transcriptions of symphonic repertoire, vocal repertoire, and it was like satisfying <laughs> and egoistic, egoistic need. You know, it's like, I, I don't know what you like, I, but I love women. So it's like walking in the street, you see a beautiful woman, and you know that you cannot have her, and you want her even more. Right. Or, you know what I mean? So, this 
it, it's the same phenomenon. I wanted to play all these things. Now, about your second question, yes, uh, I'm going to reveal to you something even worse than what you have asked. Okay. Um, I personally believe in personal integrity, and <clears throat> we have to respect our own personal integrity and never go against what we feel that it's the right thing, the most ethically possible. <clears throat> So in 82 or 83, 1983 about, when we did the recording with uh, Maestro Ormandy of the least uh, three pieces we recorded for EMI, um, then at the same time, I met the most important agent on the planet, uh, who was the president of uh, Columbia Artist Management, okay. the biggest uh, age. Mr. Ronald Wilford. He was very kind. He requested to meet me. So we had a meeting in his office with his uh, assistant. And he says, we believe in your musicianship and <clears throat> we have a contract here. Uh, now, could you please tell us what kind of programs you play in your concerts? Now, this contract was supposed to be for uh, North America, US, Canada, Mexico. Okay. Because for those who don't know that, or those who do not know that, Mexico is part of North America. Okay? So, then, I say, well, right now, as you know, I have a contract with, uh, a recording contract with Helbeck. We, are, we just recorded the Pastoral Symphony of Liszt, the number six arranged for piano by Liszt, and we intend to do all of them. And I am programmed to play in several concerts, among them the Frankfurt Festival and other places in Germany, and so on. And then his face changed. He said to me, you should not play transcriptions. Wow. Maurizio, Maurizio Pollini, you know, the famous Italian yes, yes. pianist, made it without transcriptions. Well, I wanted to answer, but I didn't think about it. Well, he plays the uh, Petrushka... Stravinsky of Petrushka, which is arranged by Stravinsky himself on the piano. But anyway, I didn't think about it. And he said, no, you are not allowed to play transcription. Wow. A few days later. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's A the most powerful later, agent, I guess, in classical music in a way. It was, it was, it was, it was. For, for not in, in a way, he was the most important agent in the world, okay? And he was a great personality. I very... Uh, I, I, of course, we all respected him, you know. And a few days later, I was playing a concert in Washington, D.C. with uh, the National Symphony Orchestra, uh, conducted by uh, its uh, artistic director, Maestro Rostropovich. Okay? Mr. Rostropovich, who was the number one uh, cellist who escaped from, uh, who left Soviet Union and all that. So, and on the day of the concert, I had a phone call with the assistant of Mr. Wilford, and he said to me, we want to be able to approve all your program, all your oh. concert program worldwide. Oh. Then I answered, worldwide? You are supposed to have a contract with me for North America. Yeah. No, yes, yes, he said, but we want to approve. I say, look, I'm very sorry, Okay, I'm thinking about that. Then I sent a letter to Mr. Wilford. It was a great pleasure to meet you, Mr. Wilford. You are a legend for all of us. But I'm sorry, there is an incompatibility. I don't know if this word exists in English. It does, yeah. Incompatible. Okay, like in French, incompatible. And I'm afraid that I cannot, uh, we cannot work together because of this incompatibility about transcriptions. Thanks God or thanks whomever, Things have changed in the last few years, yeah. and transcriptions are accepted. You know, wow. who wants to record again the 32 sonatas of Beethoven when you know that there are about 70 recorded versions <laughs> of, the seven, of the 32 That is sonatas an amazing story that you just, you just mentioned. That is unbelievable. Wow. Well, it's the first time. It's the first time I mention this publicly. Wow, and that really explains why. That, I mean, I mean, do you know, uh, Ciprin? Do you know why this attitude exists existed? I think personally that maybe I am wrong. After the creative and imaginative 
way of playing the piano at the end of the 19th and the first, I would say, 40 years of the 20th centuries, maybe there were some ex- uh, excesses, excesses, because you can play you can play with a lot of creativity and imagination and fantasy like Ignaz Friedman or Moritz Rosenthal, you know, but sometimes uh, maybe some people did not like, did not appreciate the freedom, the freedom in their interpretations. And also some other pianists, which I will not give the names, maybe have... Uh, use their imagination and fantasy and creativity in a way which could be understood as bad taste. Okay. And because of that, because of that, probably there was a reaction about a much, much, much more academic, and I would say for my personal taste, uh, uh, boring uh, right. way of interpreting piano. I mean, too much urtext. You know the expression oh, okay. urtext. Okay. This is a, this is a great. You, this is leading us in so many great ways. Um, uh, because you mentioned on an interview with Kathy Fuller on Boston's All Classical Station, you commented. You said, "If I may give advice to a young pianist, because you had just they had just played your waltz in C sharp minor." To, yeah. and some advice to people who students who listen to this version don't do that in a competition otherwise they will kill you they will just, oh. and and because it has to do with this academic or you call academic way of learning the piano now and the way it's judged that is different from an older way of playing so what is this difference between the academic and the older way the academic is it is too much urtext urtext means an addition you take a score which is urtext, it just has all the notes printed as written by the composer, okay? But the the notes as they are written is not enough. They mean much more. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to play uh, fast a piece which has been written adagio or the other way, but what I'm trying to say is that the composer has much to say which is not enough in the way, it cannot be expressed enough perfectly uh, in the way the notes are, because it's limited, you know, you write notes on the piano, you write notes on the piano, for example, I write this, I write the notes of this uh, run, but in the context of the phrasing before and afterwards, maybe the composer meant or maybe he meant you know right. so he doesn't write all those things he imagines and as a composer I can also tell you that uh, I fully understand somebody let's take an example like Chopin who when he used to play himself his own pieces uh, again or when in the same piece there were two uh, or three parts of the piece which are the same he was always changing the way he played because it's too much limitative limitative to just write the notes so we if, if, i mean if you want to play urtext a piece then you don't need so many pianists on this planet you just take a computer right. you know what i mean right right so sometimes excuse me sometimes the interpretation might be something very subtle, sometimes not so subtle. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that the creativity of the, of the interpreter, of the performer, of the pianist, should never be suppressed. But on the other hand, on the other hand, the pianist has the responsibility to not just do anything which doesn't make sense because it could be very easily bad taste right. or it could very easily be uh, uh, non- nonsenseful. And this is why I am a little bit uh, cautious about uh, uh, people who play very well but who play systematically different from others only to be different. 
it has always to be natural, you know, spontaneous yes. and natural, not calculated. Can I ask you about, you've, you've stated your dislike of piano competitions publicly. What do you feel like? Because you have won competitions, you've been a, on the jury in competitions, so you clearly have some, a lot of experience with this. What do you feel, can you explain your position on piano competitions? It's very simple. It's very simple, uh, Nikhil. Um, competitions, we say in French, mal nécessaire, a necessary Evil, I would say, not evil, a necessary, something unpleasant, but necessary. Right. First of all, first of all, it is today probably the only way for a young pianist to get some attention. Okay? <coughs> even, <coughs> excuse me, even if he doesn't get the first prize, or even if she does not get the first prize, it is the only way to get some attention. Uh, for example, some pianists who didn't get the first prize make a much bigger career today than some who did the, get the first prize in the same competition. But on the other hand, I really dislike, I really dislike uh, the fact that we jury members, we are just sitting there and uh, we have to vote for young pianists who sometimes some of us, some of us jury members, have maybe a personal reason to a favor. Maybe the young pianist was a student of that, or maybe the young pianist, I have seen all those cases, you know, it's very terrible. I have even the case of young pianist uh, who had in the jury his piano professor or a previous piano professor before he or she finished uh, the studies at the music school or whatever. But for some reason, that professor does not like that pianist. God knows what happened. And she or he will not favor. On the other side, it could be the other way that she or he will favor. So I like the competitions which forbid us to influence each other. This is very good. Mm. When I was at the Chopin competition, or even uh, um, uh, uh, last year at the Hong Kong competition, you know, we are not supposed to express our opinions one jury member to the other one. Mm. And the other thing which makes me really crazy, you know, you hear, I'm going to state this very loudly now, I mean, you hear sometimes some young pianists uh, from China even, or from Singapore, or from another place of a part of the world, who play so much better than most of the famous pianists, and so much better than many, many jury members. <laughs> and I have the impression, I have the impression that this creates maybe a jealousy. Um, reaction among some jury members. So, you know, I am a totally independent person and I say what I believe, what I think, and then you hear these young pianists who are so fantastic and then they disappear. They disappear. Because the career is, a, is a, something very mysterious. The ingredients are very, very special, very mysterious. And if a record company decides to take someone who is not as great as someone else, there is nothing you can do against it. Nothing. It's, it's awful. Awful. On the other side, let's face it, the market, we kill the market, is saturated. Even without the COVID-19, even without this, this beautiful, uh, uh, so beautiful, you know, have you noticed that the COVID-19 has beautiful colors? The colors are so pretty. Anyway, <laughs> even without even without the COVID nineteen, uh, the market is so saturated. I am very concerned what will happen with all those young pianists. Are they going to become piano teachers and train new ones and and so on? I mean, it's crazy. 
it's crazy. Can I uh, can I switch gears now because we're running out of time? Uh, I want to relay yeah. an interesting anecdote. I want to talk about sight reading. Now, this is from an interview with Koji Atwood. And he was asked about the most ridiculous musical feat he had ever witnessed. And let me read you what he said. I saw Cyprian Katsaris sight read the Norma fantasy. It was pretty ridiculous. The first time through, he sight read it. The second time through, he already had the conception of the piece. The third time, he was adding stuff. And of course, the G major section with the octaves, he was playing it 10 times faster. He is an incredible sight reader. I've seen him do other sight reading feats, but, but that's the one that made me think, you've got to be kidding me. So <laughs> I've got to ask you, how did you get so good at sight reading? First of all, I would like to express my admiration to uh, Koji Atwood, who I know, who I have met a few times in the United States, and who is really a great young pianist. I wish he had the same career like, uh, okay, let's not name some very, very, very famous people again, because he deserves it, and he makes phenomenal transcriptions. Listen to his fourth symphony of uh, Tchaikovsky, and so many other things he did, okay? Now, excuse me, but he's exaggerating. <laughs> he's exaggerating, and I do not necessarily agree with what he said. Okay. However, I have to say that when I was in the Paris Conservatoire, we had, uh, all of us, we had to attend a special um, sight-reading class. And I remember my teacher, she was a very nice lady, Madame Yvonne Drapier, she even composed some nice pieces. I have a, I have one of them. And what she used to do, uh, she used to ask us, for example, to play, uh, to get used to playing the last, uh, uh, excuse me, not the last, the, the left hand of the first famous waltz of Chopin. Let me try here. Uh, you know the famous waltz? Okay. Only the the left hand without looking at the hand to get used to play without looking all the time at your hands because your your attention has to be on the score right right so uh, and she used also a little piece of paper she asked you read first bar you have just two two seconds to read the first bar for example and start now and when you play the first bar She's already hiding the first bar with a little piece of paper, yeah. and you must read in advance the second bar, you know, and so on. But the, the horrible thing was that you don't get the, the, they used to call it in those years, the medal. Uh, it was like the final prize, the medal uh, for sight reading. If you didn't get it after four years, you were expelled <laughs> from the post. <laughs> That's amazing. It was very hard, wow. very hard. And you had to know very well solfeggio. Solfeggio, everybody hates solfeggio because I think the reason is because teachers do not know how to teach solfeggio and so many children get discussed. But I had a phenomenal teacher, Madame Lemitre, and my first piano professor sent me to her and during one year, she trained me with solfeggio and in one year, she got me at the same level like a four-year student of the conservatoire. I did take with her what, during one year private lessons. And when I went into the conservatoire, only after one year, I got the diploma for solfeggio also, you know. So these trainings are quite important, you know, harmony, solfeggio, counterpoint, fugue, and all these things. How important is the metronome in practice? Should we use it all the time, sometimes, or not at all? The most important thing in practicing, this is what I always try to explain in my master classes, is to go step by step, step by step, step by step, and again, step by step, which means, first, to try to find the best fingering. Our worst enemy, all of us, is impatience. Because we are musicians, whether it's just musician or whether it's a classic or whatever, we want to play to produce music. We go too fast uh, um, as far as the gradient is concerned. So to find the best fingerings, to try slow a little bit faster, a little bit faster, the metronome can help 
uh, us to get some discipline. Sometimes it's not necessary because if we are disciplined enough, we can do it little by little, step by step without the metronome. But the use of the metronome is a good thing to try to get first the right fingerings. And when we find out after having practiced during two, three days, the same passage from slow to fast, it doesn't work to try to investigate to find another fingering. But the basic golden rule is step by step. Now, you mentioned learning counterpoint fugue. How do you think theory-wise? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's Schenker, there's Riemann, there's all sorts of uh, theories. The Paris Conservatory has a great tradition as well. How do you think of music theory, uh, Cyprian? Music theory is important also because it's basic. I remember we, we had to attend the music history class by a famous musicologist, uh, Norbert Dufour, I remember, uh, music theory is also important, but I think uh, the the most important thing is the feeling of the performer uh, uh, connected to all those other information. Music theory, solfeggio, harmony, contrapunt, understanding of the piece, analyzing the score if necessary. I say if necessary because it depends on the capacity, on the abilities of, uh, of, of uh, a person which might be different than the ability of another person. So, yes, music theory is good. To know about the composer's lives is also good. But the most important thing, I think, personally, is the quality of practicing, and not the, necessarily the quantity. You can practice 10 hours a day the wrong way, you will not improve. And you know, when I have a master class, uh, if uh, the student has, uh, uh, for example, uh, a difficulty, mechanical difficulty, let's call it, let's call it mechanical, technical, right. whatever you want, difficulty, I tell them, we will handle this right away. It might take 30 seconds, it might take 30 minutes, but we will handle it. And I always find out that the reason, you know, I even had students coming out from Juilliard School or the Moscow, the Tchaikovsky Moscow Conservatory. I never forget that lady, the young lady who came out from the Moscow Conservatory and she had some technical difficulties. And I asked her, what was your professor telling you? She said she was talking about interpretation, but that's not enough. So I helped her and now she can play those things she was uh, having trouble uh, playing, uh, you know. So it depends on the quality, on the quality. Right. Um, you're a composer as well. What is your compositional process? Okay. My compositions, uh, my compositional process is immediate. For example, uh, about, uh, when was that? About 30 years ago, I was in the mountains in Cyprus in August. And after finishing practicing at 2 a.m. in the night, I decided to maybe try to get closer to uh, the Mozart style. And suddenly I had this melody, which is uh, more in the dramatic um, way of Mozart composing, which I then recorded and which is on one of my Sony classical recordings called Mozartiana. And this is the beginning. <laughs> And then later on, a more joyful, elegant style of Mozart. For example, on a uh, TV uh, program here in France, a live TV program, they asked me to improvise and there was a beautiful young lady. Oh, Nikki, she was so pretty. <laughs> 19 years old. Her name was Pauline. And she requested that I improvise uh, on something which could be considered the dialogue between Robert and Clara Schumann. And then came this thing. <laughs> Etc. 
cetera, et cetera. Beautiful, beautiful. So thank you. This is one style. On one of my last CDs called uh, Elective Affinities, which is based on the title of a famous uh, novel by Goethe, the great German Goethe. Uh, you have a piece called Merci, Monsieur Chopin. Well, uh, uh, Cyprian, can I ask you, sorry to interject, but this, uh, yes? your, your ability to seemingly just play any style, does that come from you absorbing it from playing the repertoire? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But I also improvised and recorded uh, they are not written down. Uh, several musics which could be used for a movie, for movie, and you can listen to maybe five or six of them if you type on YouTube, Katsaris, uh, Tokyo, uh, improvises his light on his light music, because I played about 10 years ago or 12 years ago, five or six of them. Uh, in a public concert. It was the very first time I did it. And also a few years later in New York uh, at a special concert uh, at, the, at the Lincoln Center. And now I must have about 30 of those. They are not yet uh, issued officially on CDs, but maybe it will come in the in the near future. Okay, uh, Cyprian, let's end off with some fun. I know you have time's running short, so I'm just going to ask you a couple of fast questions, just for fun, and just whatever comes to okay. mind, and we'll end off with a, with a bit okay. of a blast. So, first question: What is your okay. proudest musical moment? Oh, proudest! Oh my God! Okay, my proudest music moment was when I played the transcription by Maestro Cifra of his own Bumblebee, and he was sitting right there and watching and listening, and you can find it on YouTube. If you could step into a time machine and meet any of the great composers or musicians, who would it be? It would be Chopin, Liszt, Mendelssohn, all these people, and, uh, and uh, maybe also at Talberg, who is a not-so-famous name, but who did phenomenal things. He was the rival, the the competitor of Franz Liszt, Albert. Can you name me the three hardest things you've ever had to play in your life? The Flight of the Bumblebee by Cifra. Uh, and then, then nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> there is a big, big distance, big distance between that piece and all the other ones. Um, the, what are the hardest concertos for you to play? Believe it or not, it's not Rack 3, it's not Brahms 2. I would say more Mozart concertos because you can hear so easily a mistake. Do you play any other instruments other than the piano? I tried when I was a kid to play the violin and it was such a disaster <laughs> that you cannot play. <laughs> um, have you ever dabbled on the harpsichord or the organ or the electric keyboard? I have tried all of them. And I hope one day I shall be able to develop this. I have had some ideas about making maybe a CD on several keyboard instruments, um, but it's quite confidential for the moment. Okay. If you could have done it all over again, what would you have changed about your career? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, you asked me uh, fast answers also. So, <laughs> absolutely because I always kept my personal integrity. Music-wise, it's very important to not compromise on your personal integrity for career reasons. And look, look, I am still here, and this gentleman is not anymore here. You know the agent yes, that mentioned yes, before. Yes, yes, absolutely. Although, although, he, although he was a great person. At what age did you feel you had your sound, your voice, your mature conception as an artist? Believe it or not, it was quite young, uh, although the, the, some very important steps happened when I was around 19, 20 years old. And when I listened to some recordings, I, I did them when I was, okay, the first ones were around, uh, I was uh, 20, 21, yes, when I was 21, 22, 23 years old. I mean, if you, if you listen to my list sonata, a live recording in the mountains uh, when I was 23 and there was somebody with an amateur recorder, a recording machine, recording it, and thanks God we have it now. It's published and it's also on YouTube. 
I don't think I would change anything today. Who are the top three greatest composers? Impossible to answer. Chopin, <laughs> uh, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, please. We are already too far. <laughs> Tchaikovsky, Rahman, you know. <laughs> Name your three proudest records, the ones, your recordings. This is also impossible because I love all of them. Otherwise, I, I would have not authorized their publication. Okay, let me switch the question. If, you, if somebody wanted to hear you, your music, what are the first three albums they should listen to? You are a very clever boy. <laughs> How old are you, by the way? Uh, I'm 34. Oh, I see. So you start, you start, you are starting getting mature. Good, good. I'm happy for that. <laughs> the three CDs I would recommend. Well, I would recommend them to listen to one of our complete Mozart recordings, uh, which will, which are now uh, on uh, all the iTunes and all those platforms, digital, and it, it will come next in a few months. Uh, it was done twenty. Five, uh, 20, 23 years ago in uh, live recordings in Salzburg with corrections of course of, uh, I would recommend the CD which has the concerto number 21 and also the one which has number 20 and uh, another kind of music I would recommend is my Bach CD of original works of uh, of CDs, of, of, of music by Bach, not necessarily the transcriptions ones, but the one which has original works such as the Partita Number no. 1, uh, French Suite, and so on. There is a small piece called Allegro, which nobody plays on the piano, which is phenomenal, the music. And I would recommend, of course, the Rachmaninoff Number no. 3 production uh, 40 years ago in Eastern Germany, in the Communist Germany, in Leipzig, with the great uh, symphony orchestra of Leipzig Radio, conducted by Horst Neumann. Name me your three most important compositions. Not, not anyone. It's not my task to judge this. But, but, I can tell you, you know, there is always but. Yeah. In 76, in 76, I composed a piece which is very, very modern, uh, but ple- but uh, you can listen to it. I mean, without suffering too much. <laughs> it's called Le Poem du Phoenix, the poem of the Phoenix. Yep. You know, the Phoenix, this legend of yeah. Yep. And it was based. It was based on a sculpture and a poem by a friend of mine who passed away recently, Madame Gloria Morris. She was American, and the the it is in three sections, and the second section is based on each letter of each word of the poem. And I love this piece, but I never played it again. But thanks God, or thanks whomever, or thanks to ourselves, <laughs> it, was, it was recorded live, live at a concert in Nicosia, the capital of Cyprus, excuse me, the divided capital of Cyprus, yes. the only divided capital in the world. And thanks God, it was recorded by the Cyprus Radio Broadcasting, and I hope one day that we will issue it. Wonderful, wonderful. So, important piece for me. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you are good friends with Chick Corea. I've always wanted to yes. ask you: Do you listen to much jazz? Do you secretly play jazz? I secretly try to play jazz. I have a lot of scores. My, my, of course, my greatest uh, favorite pianist is Art Tatum. Okay, and I am more. You know, a, a few years ago, I met a big, big, big jazz specialist here in Paris. We spent five hours, and he played for me so many records, and he gave me so many copies, which he compiled for me. And to be honest with you, I adore jazz, and I hope that before I die, I am going to be 17 next year, and I intend to die only after I am one or five years old. So I still have the time for some just surprise. Wonderful, wonderful. You mentioned earlier that you're a Scientologist. And now how does that inform, when did you become one? How does that inform your music and your life? Well, I studied Scientology since December 76. And it helped me a lot to increase my ability to communicate the various emotions of life which you find in music. Because, you know, there is a scale established by Ron Hubbard of all the emotions. It's very fascinating. And when you know about all those, 
you can also control better your life. And musically, it has been a very, very big help to communicate music emotion to the audience because you know the problem. You listen to wonderful pianists who play without a single mistake and nothing happens. They don't touch you because they don't know how to do it. So I do recommend it to anyone who loves music, art, or anything in life to at least try to get information. There is even a Scientology channel, TV channel, about what it is exactly and to, necess- and to absolutely not listen or read the fake news on, on the internet. But you just to just go to source of what it is exactly and then make up your minds by yourselves. I, I missed out the uh, one classic question is who are the top three pianists of the 20th century? For me, it's Sifra, Ignaz Friedman, and Moritz Rosenthal. Wonderful. Well, the great Cyprian Katsaris, I mean, one of the, the, the greatest pianists, I mean, of the 20th and the 21st century. He's had a remarkable, fantastic career. I really hope you had a good time on the interview, and it was really my pleasure to ask you these questions. I really admire you, your artistry, and I, I really hope to be able to talk to you again soon. I do also hope that we will talk again soon, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your interest in my modest work. And I would like to send also my very kindest regards to your audience. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cyprian. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.